Why do you think we were so ill-prepared for uh, coronavirus? We haven't recognized as a global community that we are a global community. And if we had recognized that and stepped up to it, we would mm -hmm. have prepared for this. We would have systems in place, both monitoring, alerting very quickly. We would have had test kits available. We would have just, it, you know, we plan for things as nations. We plan for earthquakes. We plan for tsunamis. We plan for tornadoes. Right. We didn't plan for disease. And I don't think that will ever happen now, thank God. You and Bill and the Gates Foundation are literally putting billions of dollars right now behind um, the ability to quickly manufacture eight different potential vaccines just in case one or two of them may work. The vaccine is the ultimate solution. What we are doing is preparing with our many, many, many partners. We're bringing compounds forward, and then we have about eight different vaccines candidates that will go into trials. Those are the ones we're working on. Their partners working on others as well. There's a little glimmer of hope in just the last few days, and that is a human tr trial, human testing beginning for one of these vaccines and the development of it partly backed by you guys um, from a company called Innovio. How, how promising is that? I'd say it looks promising. We wouldn't have put it into preclinical trials if it wasn't. But, you know, to be honest, since we've been in this this business before of vaccines, you want to have many candidates going into trials. So we obviously sure. put our most promising ones forward first, but I'm going to feel better when we have all eight into clinical trials. The fact that the data show us that African Americans in the United States are getting coronavirus more and are dying at a much higher rate. When you started to see these numbers come in, what did you think? It was heartbreaking when the numbers started to come in. We thought that might be the case. Um, but what I see is that, you know, COVID-19, if it, it affects everybody, but affects people differently. We need a national response and it needs to be equitable. What was the moment like for you, Melinda, if there was one when this hit you personally? When I saw what China had to do to, to isolate such an enormous part of their population, my first thought was Africa. How in the world are they going to deal with this? I've been in townships all over Africa in slums. When we talk about in our country physical distancing and then hand washing, if you live in a slum, you can't physical distance. You have to go out and get your meal. You don't have clean water to wash your hands. And so as soon as I saw that, and we know from the foundation's work how quickly disease spreads, I thought, oh my gosh, we have a crisis on our hands that we aren't even talking about yet in the United States and what's going to happen to the rest of the world. That's how much worse it's going to be in the developing world. It's going to be horrible in the developing world. And part of the reason you're seeing the case numbers still don't look very bad is because they don't have access to very many tests. So, you know, look at Ecuador. Look at what's going on in Ecuador. They're putting bodies out on the street. You're going to see that in countries in Africa. You think that this pandemic is just actually going to set us back in terms of gender disparity, that it will disproportionately fall on women. What do you mean? Here's what I know is that 70% of the healthcare workers around the world are women. Women do more than two times the unpaid labor in their homes. So they're caring for people in the health system and they're caring for people at home. And at the same time, we have this disparity that we're not collecting what we call disaggregated data. What that means is we're not differently differentiating data that comes in about men and women. I wonder what, what keeps you up at night right now. What keeps me up at night are the vulnerable populations. Um, you know, it, what keeps me up at night is in the U.S., the kids who are falling behind because they don't have access to broadband or to a computer, so they're not yeah. getting to continue their learning. What keeps me up at night are the vulnerable populations who I know in Africa, or I've met some of them. Um, I can't imagine being a parent in those circumstances. And those are the things that keep me up at night.